uh, Matthew chapter 22, and we're going to read from verse 34 uh, through to 46. Uh, That's on page 877 in your pew Bibles. When Jesus heard that he had, when the Pharisees had heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they came together in the same place. And one of them, an expert in the law, asked a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. While the Pharisees were together, Jesus questioned them. What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? David's, they told him. He asked them, How is it then that David, inspired by the Spirit, calls him Lord? The Lord declared to my Lord, Sit on my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David calls him Lord, how then can the Messiah be his son? No one was able to answer him at all. And from that day, no one dared to question him anymore. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, as normal, there's a sermon outline there uh, inside your newsletters, some household questions uh, up on the other side. And uh, if you've missed out on any of the sermons, uh, please feel free uh, to hop on our website Uh, and watch or listen to them. Uh, Ben and I and uh, a number of other clergy were up in Armidale on Thursday and uh, we had some training with Anglicare. Uh, It was actually a terrific day of training. Uh, We were looking at the issue of domestic violence and uh, how to deal with that uh, as people involved uh, in the community. Uh, When we sat down, uh, all the clergy across the diocese there, uh, usually when we sit down, everyone starts whispering to each other because there's always some new faces And we want to know who they are and where they fit. Which parish are they in? Are they married? Are they single? Where have they come from? Why are they in that parish and not that parish? You see, we all like to work out where people fit, don't we? We like to work out where they belong, (laughs) where they fit into our world. What's our relationship with them? Uh, Which community are they in? How do I deal with them? Uh, Such a question is a matter of identity and relationship. Helps us understand who the person is and how we and others are going to relate to them. Uh, At its best, which I think is what happened on Thursday, and a lot of guys went and chatted to each other, at its best, it helps strengthen relationships, doesn't it, when you ask that question? Uh, It helps build understanding and community. Uh, At its worst, when you ask that question, you can just reduce someone, can't you? Uh, You can whack them in a box. You can minimise them. And then when you've done that, you can then work out how to ignore them, can't you? or how they'll actually just live up to your low expectations of them. Jesus has come into Jerusalem. It's the final week of his life before he dies on the cross. People have been asking that question all week, haven't they? Remember as he came into the city, who's this bloke? And they've asked it for good and bad motives. Today's the last time they ask it in this week. Let me pray and we're going to look at it together. Father, thanks for your word. I thank you that it's living and active. I thank you that you change us by your word. Thank you that it's your word that brings both judgment and life. Your word brings us face to face with our sin and our need and your amazing, extravagant grace and love. Please apply to us today. Amen. As Tim mentioned before, we've been taking some snapshots uh, of Jesus last week as he leads up to his death. Uh, As we've been looking at that, we've seen God's plans at Easter because we all planned something for Easter, even God did, funnily enough. And as we confront God's plans at Easter, uh, we're forced to think about our own and what we do do with this king. Uh, He's coming to Jerusalem on a donkey. As he comes into Jerusalem, we're reminded that he's God's promised king who enters Jerusalem for one reason, to die. He's talked about that from Matthew 16, and he's doing that so that God's people could have their sins forgiven. People like Matthew could be brought in from the outside, inside. He comes to his own house. He cleans it up, doesn't he? 
He then comes into his house the next day and he teaches and confronts the leaders of God's people. As he does so, as we heard last week, he wants his people to be defined by faithful obedience. Now, if you come back and take a bird's eye view of this week, you'll notice that the whole week is a week of immense and personal conflict for Jesus. We struggle and are apprehensive about one moment of conflict. He's getting it at every moment. Uh, Throughout that week, each day and in different ways, the religious leaders charge out and they attack him. Uh, If you look in your Bibles, uh, 21, 15 to 16, 21, verse 23, chapter 22, 15 to 16, chapter 22, 23 to 24, each attacks a different coalition, a different combination of religious leaders. Each attack involves a different question. Each attack has the same motive. Chapter 22, verse 18, they're malicious and they want to trip him up. And each attack is met by Jesus. He doesn't run. He doesn't hide. He answers gently, bluntly, biblically. And in chapter 22, verse 22, we're told that his answers have amazed them. That doesn't stop them. And today's coalition of the willing consists of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. There in verse 36, these are the theological purists. These are the people who tick all the theological boxes. They know the big words that end in Sean. And they're all the lawyers who've come to deal with Jesus, hand in hand. They've just seen their enemies defeated. I suspect they're rubbing their hands with glee, these Pharisees, because the Sadducees went down in a flaming heat. But they come with their own question, and they get one of their lawyers to test him. I point to on the outline, verse 36. One of them, an expert in the law, asked a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? That's a dangerous question. It's dangerous for Jesus because depending on how he answers it, he's going to leave some part of God's law, isn't he? And then you can accuse him for not treating God's word seriously. It's a dangerous question because it attempts to cut to the heart of where God's people stand with God and how they relate to him. Uh, On the one hand, it's a really nasty attempt to box Jesus, to just wedge him. Uh, On the other hand, I think it exposes an even greater evil on the part of those who are asking it because they really just want to reduce Jesus, don't they? And when they ask that kind of question, they're actually aiming to reduce God's word to the things that are important and the things I can ignore. Have you ever asked that question? What bits can I ignore? What bits do I have to pay attention to? You see, the evil of reduction is deep. How could you reduce God's words to just one or two commands when the words themselves reveal the nature of God? How could you take the whole body of God's words Words that bring creation into existence, that bring the judgment of death and the wonder of life. How could you take all of those words and just go, actually, it's just one or two? As if you'd want to reduce God's words. But that's what they want to do with Jesus, isn't it? They want to box him so they can get rid of him. Jesus' response. Do you notice we're never given Jesus' tone? Do you notice that? Just like we're not given any physical description of Jesus. Jesus' response is lovely and it's blunt and it exposes the questioners and their motives. Look there in verse 37. He said to them, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. He takes his questioners back to God's word. Deuteronomy 6, Leviticus 19. Deuteronomy 6, that's Moses' last words on the edge of the promised land. He's not going in. And he wants to remind God's people of God's goodness, 
their love for him and what faithful obedience looks like. And the other one, Leviticus 19, it's just a summary of what it looks like to represent God to the world, as if you could say just. What it looks like to represent God to the world. And it seems like Jesus is falling into the trap, doesn't it? Because he actually answers their question. Uh, His first answer points to a right relationship with God. Uh, Come with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, God has done exactly as he promised. He's saved his people out of slavery. He's brought them to his mountain. He's made them his mob. He's worked with them in grace and mercy and innovation. Now he's brought them to the border of the land that he's promised them. There in Deuteronomy 6 verse 1, so that you may follow these laws as you go into the land, into the land flowing with milk and honey. And let me tell you, Moses is saying, there is no one like God. Did you notice that there in verse 4? The Lord is one. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. There is no one like him. And as the recipients of his extravagant love, his abundant mercy, how should you deal with God? Well, love him with every fibre of your being. It's all encompassing. Every muscle twitch, every synapse, Every cell, every thought, every movement, how does that show that I love God? Because every fibre of his being, as if he had a fibre, has been devoted to getting God's people to this place. And you're to teach it to your children in every part of their existence. The second part of Jesus' answer flows out of loving God to loving other people. And that's in Leviticus 19. Come with me to Leviticus, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 19. And in Leviticus 19, as God unpacks what it looks like in daily life to love him with every fibre of your being. This is what he says, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses, speak to the entire Israelite community and tell them, be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. How are God's people to live defined by God? Who's God? We've just been told there's only one of him, isn't there? He's unique. That's what the word holy literally means. There's no one like God. And so his people reflect that to the world. There's no one like the people of God. They're unique. And when you unpack what Leviticus 19 is all about and you go through to verse 18 and you see love your neighbour as yourself, you are loving anyone who bears the image of God. Anyone. Anyone. And as you love them, you deal with them in the same way God has dealt with you. So you reflect his nature to the world, his grace and his love. When you look at all the stuff around verse 18 there, you'll see it's about speaking truth. You'll see it's about avoiding slander and holding on to grudges. It's about avoiding anger and slander and gossip and rumour. It's about gently rebuking your neighbour who is in sin and being rebuked by them. It's living with people in a way that's unique in the world. What other group of people does that? Overlooks the slander and doesn't participate in it. What other group gives to their enemies what they don't deserve? What other group loves in the same way you have been loved And so it goes to others. At this point, you'd think that Jesus has just answered their question, reduced it to two, we can tick those boxes and off we go. But then when you come back to Matthew chapter 22, you see that Jesus has verse 40 there. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. He hasn't reduced it, he's just expanded it. He's just blown it out of the water. This command to love, this dual command to love God and to love your neighbour is not a reduction, it's a foundation. And it flows out into every part of God's word. All of God's words are encompassed by the character of God. And as if you could reduce that. And Jesus has just helped us see how astounding it is. It doesn't put Jesus in a box, does it? It blows the box up. 
and extends what it means to be God's people into every part of life. And it actually exposes them and shows them to be a rebellious, hard-hearted group. And they really ask this question, not just to put Jesus in a box, but to get the boxes they can tick. Yes, sir. Remember that from last week? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But their hearts are still hard. Jesus takes the opportunity at this point to then ask them a question. And the same language is used of him, except his motives are pure, as is used of the teacher of the law. Look there in verse 41, I'm at point three on the outline. While the Pharisees were together, Jesus questioned them. What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? Remember the Messiah? He's that bloke chosen by God to save the world. That's a useful summary, isn't it? He's connected with being the king of the world. He's connected with a particular family called the family of David, one of the great kings. And God has said, I'm going to pick this bloke, I'm going to send him into the world, and he's actually going to bind up the broken world and restore it to what it should be. And and so he asks these religious leaders, who do you reckon the Messiah is? What's his family tree? It's a question about paternity. They get the answer, don't they? It's there. In verse 42, David's, they told him. They know their family trees. They know their history. They know their Bibles. We know they've got the right answer, don't we? Was there the genealogy at the start? Remember that one? Descended from David? Well, they've got that straight. Except Jesus then is really uncomfortable because he goes a little further. Did you notice that? He asked them, well, how is it then that David, inspired by the Spirit, calls him Lord? The Lord declared to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Now, if David calls him Lord, how then can the Messiah be his son? In essence, what father calls his son boss? Jesus is trying to expose their inability to read God's word. He quotes their hymn book back at them. I've loved that in Jerusalem. Do you notice how often Jesus quotes their hymn book back at them? It's a reminder that we should probably pay attention to what we sing all the time. I'm so thankful for how good our songs are, reminding us of God's word. He takes them back to their hymn book and he takes them to Psalm 110. Turn with me to Psalm 110. Katrina read it earlier. It's a corker of a psalm written by David. Inspired by the Holy Spirit. Notice how Jesus says that there. So so be careful how you argue this one, gentlemen. And it recounts, you'll see in verse 1 of Psalm 110, a really important relationship. The Lord declared to my Lord. David's written it. And he said something remarkable there. God said to my boss. It's a psalm about the saviour of the world the Messiah, and David calls the Messiah my boss. And when you look at the psalm, you can see why. God says to his chosen king, David's boss, here, come and sit at my right hand. God says to his chosen king, David's boss, the whole world will be yours. God says to his chosen king, who's David's boss, that you will permanently stand between God and the universe representing God to people, representing people to God. David recognises in verses 5 to 7 that this boss, his son, is going to crush everyone and judge the nations, just like Psalm 2 said. So the Messiah is descended from David, but he's much bigger than that, isn't he? He's much bigger than that. He's going to be God's son because do you know what? God will only ever share that right seat with his boy. God only ever gives his boy that type of authority. God only ever allows his boy to rule the universe. God only ever allows his boy to judge the nations. Gentlemen, haven't you noticed that the Messiah is David's son and God's son? Haven't you noticed, gentlemen, that the Messiah is not only a human, but he's fully God? Do you see, they have been so keen to reduce Jesus that they have missed Jesus. They've even missed God's word, the very thing they wanted to reduce. 
which says very clearly the Messiah will be in David's family, but he's my boy, God says. And so they miss him and reduce him to a bloke who'll come in and kick out the Romans. He's so much more than that. He's so much more than that. It's the ultimate revelation of who Jesus is. He comes into Jerusalem and says, this is who I am. And here at the end of these conflicts, he says, this is who I am. And if he's God, what should you do with him? He's just given you the answer, hasn't he? You should love him with every fibre of your being and so love your neighbour as yourself. At this point, they start to realise, don't they? At least they start to realise they're not going to trip him up. Look there in verse 46. No one was able to answer him at all. And from that day, no one dared to question him anymore. The entry is complete. There are two bookends that reveal the nature of Jesus, a king on a donkey and the son of God. And he's both. He's come into this city in order to die, but be shown to have all authority and power and dominion. And despite the best efforts of these religious leaders, his identity, authority and place has not been undermined, but been affirmed. So where does Jesus fit? Remember that question? Well, Jesus fits on that seat next to God, on the throne of the universe, as the compassionate, humble, all-powerful, rejected, killed, resurrected king who's both man and God. I think we're still trying to work out where Jesus fits, if we're honest with ourselves. I think we still struggle to work out where he fits, which is why we ask that question, which bits can I pay attention to or ignore? We still need the revelation of a passage like this to push us to recognise him. And you'll see there on your outline, hopefully, that there's three R words to help us. We must continually ask ourselves, do we recognise Jesus as he really is? I think that should be a question every day. He is really a human being. He was born. He was raised. He knew his mum and dad. He grew in knowledge. He was a carpenter's apprentice. He worked as a carpenter. He had fingernails and calluses and he slept and he ate. He went to the toilet and he showered. In fact, only this morning as I came into church, uh, one young lady, he was talking to me about Jesus being a human. We need to recognise that. He is a human being like us. Like us. Uh, but do we recognise that he's also God's boy, God's son, the one who existed before creation and gave up everything to be incarnate in creation? Do we recognise both those together in one man? He is God and human. He is compassionate and supreme. He is humble and unique. He's the lowliest and the highest. He's the only one who can bind up this broken world because he is both. Not to recognise him like that is to reduce him. That's the danger, isn't it? It's to minimise him. It's to dismiss him as any other human. It's to say, well, he was God, so he had an unfair advantage. It's to dismiss the reality of who he is. And there's a danger in that, isn't there? There's a danger that we could become yes, sir, people, like we heard last week. You see, it's not often that I meet people who are Christians who doubt the divinity of Jesus. It's just letting him be God. Having him as God. You see, if we do acknowledge Jesus as God, don't reduce him to a lucky charm that we rub when things get troublesome. Don't reduce him to a vending machine we go to in order to get an insurance policy when life gets hard. Don't even just reduce him to a co-ruler with yourself, as if you could both sit on that seat next to God. If Jesus is God, don't reduce him by disobeying him. If Jesus is God, 
Don't reduce him by not trusting him. If Jesus is God, don't doubt his sufficiency. The man who gave everything. If Jesus is God, thirdly, let's revere him. Let's love him. Let's give to him the love of every fibre, second, inch, moment or metre of our existence. Let's respond to him in the way he has responded to us with an extravagance that cost him his life. The one who gives grace and mercy to his enemies, who speaks truth in love, who serves those who question him by dying for them. And so also love our neighbours as ourselves. So what might that look like? Oh, let me ask some questions under both those categories. Let me ask us some questions as we consider loving Jesus with every fibre of our being. Where was and is Jesus in my decisions about my labour and my employment? Where was and is Jesus in the decisions I've made about my diary this week? Where was and is Jesus in the decisions I make about retirement, my holidays, my education, my reading material, my binge-watching, and my alcohol consumption? Where was and is Jesus in the way I curated my Facebook page? I tended to my Instagram account. In the language that I typed online, in the way in which I handled TikTok and social media to display to the world a king on a donkey. Where was and is Jesus in the decisions I make about how sufficient I need resources for a good life? About where my money is? About the priorities I model for my children and my grandchildren? You see, as I make all of these decisions, I will be displaying my love for something. If Jesus is God, then how does every part of my life reflect my love for him? So let's turn to neighbours. How do we love our children and our spouses as ourselves? Because they're our neighbours, aren't they? In my language, in my time, in my job in my handling of God's word in our family life? How do I love my neighbour by deciding the people I relate to, the people I friend, the people I talk to, the people I mirror my life on as we love ourselves? How do I structure my social existence, my diary, my existence in this town to be part of a people that's unique? How do I deal with the slights and the arguments, the conflicts, the disappointments, the difficulties in my relationships? How do my social networks, my social lives, my online existence look? And is it any different from anyone else's? You see, to love our neighbours as ourselves is to reflect the nature of God and his love. It's to live as unique, as a holy community here. Are we? Let me pray. Father, your word has worked on me and, Father, your word will work on anyone who hears it by your spirit. Father, please work your word in us so that we love you with every fibre of our being and reflect your nature in our relationships. Father, this isn't to earn your favour. This isn't to pay back a debt we can hope to wipe clean. But this is to respond humbly 
to your extravagant love for us in sending your son to be the son of David and save us from our sins. Amen.